design is it's critical to a project, but it's not, as we've been talking about, it's a very small piece of the project. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce today's guest, my good friend, Jeff Ross. Jeff has a career spanning over 15 years in New York and beyond. He has established himself as a luminary in the realm of real estate development, renowned for his interdisciplinary expertise and unwavering commitment to quality. Originally hailing from Canada, Jeff has called New York City his home for over two decades. He's journey began with a solid foundation in architecture, having trained and worked in prestigious firms both in New York City and internationally. However, it was his transition to the ownership side of real estate development that truly marked the turning point in his illustrious career. Jeff's impressive portfolio includes overseeing some of the most ambitious and high-profile projects with a combined value exceeding over $3 billion. His work spans across various states from large-scale developments to the meticulous repositioning of assets in the heart of New York City. In today's episode, Jeff and I discuss the fine art of site assemblage and air rights. So this is going into a lot of detail about the kind of work that gets done before architects are actually involved or even invited to consider the site that developers are accumulating and acquiring. We also look at the finance stack, the different ways of funding and investing and how developers are raising capital to be able to get these projects up and running. We look at the different ways that developers actually make money. So we go deep into different business models that developers have and different ways that they collect fees and actually make profit and money out of the projects, not just including the sale of the final development. And we also take a behind the scenes look at what some developers are looking for when they hire architects. So if you are working with commercial developers, particularly sophisticated developers, this is a very important podcast that I encourage you to listen to. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts uh, about some of the things that Jeff is sharing. Um, You can share those in the comments or you can email me directly at Business of Architecture. Just stick my name, Ryan, at businessofarchitecture.com. So sit back, relax and enjoy the fantastic Jeff Ross. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Jeff. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Good to be back. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show again. And this time we get to do it face to face Uh in your fantastic offices here at CMD. Yeah, last time was COVID days. It was. So we were locked away in tiny bedrooms in opposite sides of the Atlantic. Yep. And um, it's been great because since then, you and I, we've met a number of times. Mm -hmm. We've had some fantastic dinners and some very good discussions and some very good discussions, which was why I was very keen to have you back on the show, because Mm -hmm. some of the insights that you've been sharing with me about development, how real estate works, particularly Mm -hmm. here in New York, Mm -hmm. has literally made my mind melt and dribble (laughs) down the back of my throat. There's lots to chew on. Yeah. Um, So let's, let's talk a little bit first about your role you were originally for your sins an architect Mm -hmm. and at some point you crossed over into the dark world of development and have found uh, a far more you know you found your your calling and your vocation and and that's where you are so tell us a little bit about your career as an architect what pulled you into development and then we can start talking about you know some of the things that architects might not know about what actually is happening behind the scenes of developers when they approach architects. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I started as an architect. I went to school for architecture. I always wanted to be an architect since I couldn't remember. 
think shortly after dump truck driver and astronaut architect was the next on the list. <laughs> uh, moved to New York, got a job working in architectural offices, small ones. Uh, there's a whole tier in New York of very small, mid-sized, 20, 30 people, and then it, it really jumps up. Uh, so I was in a few 20, 30 person offices. Enjoyed the work, um, but just kind of wanted more. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't a big enough picture for me. And the, the clincher was I had flown down to Chevy Chase, Maryland to work on a retail project. Flown in for the day, made sure that everybody had their tasks, made sure the contract was on top of things, the plumber knew where things were going, the owner's rep had blah, 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 just flowing. Got back in the car on my way to the airport and said, I was the lowest paid person there today. I need to make some changes. Yeah. So I was talking to a very good friend of mine who uh, was, is still an architect at a great firm in the city. And he knew somebody who was a client of his who needed somebody like me. And he says, you want to change to development? I'm like, why not? And the second I got there, I realized that this was the world that I wanted to be in mm -hmm. because it wasn't just sitting around drawing window details or making sure that the plumbers put things in the right place. That's part of the job too, but it's also managing the architectural teams and the engineering teams. And then you see the bigger circle. So you see the finance aspects of things or you talk to the leasing team and see what they need. And you see how the architecture part of it is just one little piece in a very large picture. Yeah. And that's fun. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you first moved over into development, what was your kind of role? What were you doing? Were you still working as an architect in, inside of a development organization or did your uh, duties start to shift and change? The architectural knowledge that I had and the architectural skill set that I had was important. Mm -hmm. I wasn't designing anything, um, but I was guiding the design. Right. And it's something I still do to this day, which is, is get the best work out of a set of architects that you possibly can. Mm -hmm cajoling, threatening, encouraging, you know, whatever it takes. People respond differently, but the, the job is to, you know, find the, the most wonderful design that a talented group of people can put together for mm -hmm. you. Uh, but then there's also managing the rest of it too, you know, the financial, financial side of things. There's whole teams of analysts who are doing crazy, insane financial calculations or people who are pulling in money to fund a project and they all need information too. So you have to sort of shift your architecture hat a little bit and sort of think about what is it that the other person actually needs from you for this. Right. So how would you describe your role here at CMD? CMD, we, we aren't developers, but we're, we're a project management group. Mm -hmm. So we run projects for other developers. Right. So a developer comes in and they might not have the experience to pull off a job. They mm -hmm. might be a little bit small or they might have picked up a project from somebody um, and it's a little that's a little broken. Mm -hmm. So we come in to, to fix it or to provide the, the bench strength for people that just don't have it. Big name companies like the headlines that you see in New York real estate, they've got us in-house already. So we're, we're serving a whole different tier of people who have incredibly large projects but just don't have the right people. Right. So a company like Vornado, for example, they'll have their own they've got project managers in-house. Dozens of me in-house. Right, got it. And so you guys are kind of like an outsourced team for developers, like a plug-in office essentially to help essentially, them. Essentially, yeah. Got it. So what kind of developers would be using your services then? We have some, uh, we have a food production company. We've now done three facilities for them. Right. Um, managing their architectural teams, their engineering teams, and the construction teams, getting the projects built. Mm -hmm. You know, when you learn that the factory is going to receive 20,000 pounds of cheese in a day to make food, you know, your mind sort of boggles, right? <laughs> We're doing a 150-acre uh, resort and branded residence project in the Caribbean right. for uh, a team of investors who hired a hospitality company, who hired us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's our job to find the architects, the engineers, manage them through the process. and manage the politics as much as possible too. Right. I, mean, I, I, remember, I know we've spoken about the hospitality world before yeah. and I, I found that very fascinating how you were describing actually there's a group of investors they're kind of provoking a project to happen somewhere and they actually bring in, bring in one of these big name hotelian, hotelier groups but they're they're, the hotel name is like the brand and they're going to run it. Mm -hmm. But then there's all these other players that are involved. Yeah, in I mean, the, the company to it's it's hotels are, are strange. And you know, every time I think that I understand how the, the, the pyramid works, I'm always surprised that there's another piece to it somehow. But yeah, typically the the brand that is the hotel, mm -hmm. the flag essentially, aren't the people who own the building. 
and they're usually not the people who built the building either. Um, there would be a team of investors who built the building and brought in the flag as like the consultants or slash management company. Um, on top of that, there's other consultants that sort of factor into the process. So there's, there's many layers of people in a hospitality project. The, the actual fact that you're there renting a hotel room for the night is not where most of the people in the project have made their money. Right? That's, that's how the hotel, <laughs> I know, it's weird, right? Well, this is all we're going to start getting into because like the, the, the business model that we might assume where money is being made is not necessarily always where the financial no. uplift is actually happening. So no. we're, we're here in you know, the heart of Manhattan mm -hmm. and you know, it's quite appropriate that we're talking about deal making. You know, Manhattan kind of famously was made on a deal 24 bucks, wasn't it? Something like that. I don't know if that's really the truth or not, but that's, that's the mythology, so we'll go with we'll it. We'll go with it. I like, I like that mythology of the, of the story. Um, and it, it brings up a question that I, I think a lot of architects are actually very ignorant mm -hmm. to what actually developers do, mm -hmm. particularly your more sophisticated developers, perhaps, you know, mom and pop type of investors, they've got a bit of cash in their building, an architect can bring a lot more strategic mm -hmm. value to a project. But certainly at the scale that you're working at and the scale that the majority of Manhattan is operating on, a lot of stuff has already been done mm -hmm. and it's a very complex, interesting world where things are being pieced together and the architect has got a little hole where they're yep. kind of being, which has already been predefined for yep. them and now they're being kind of asked to fit into it. So yep. perhaps we can start, start a little bit about so what kind of work has already been done before the architect gets involved? Well, before the architect has got involved, typically the site has been identified. Like let's, let's assume you're gonna, it doesn't matter if you're doing an office building or a residential tower or a hospitality project of some kind, right? The site's been identified. And if the site hasn't been fully purchased already, then it's probably in the process of being purchased. Um, either directly as a single piece or by building up an assemblage. Um, assemblage is more of a New York thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it happens everywhere, but uh, it's almost a game in New York, right? All the lots in New York are standard 25 by 100, and then they've been pieced together into larger and larger lots. So if you want to build an office tower, for instance, somewhere, you're going to need a whole bunch of land. And that land might be occupied by other buildings. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to find out who owns each of those buildings, make them a deal to buy that building from them. You're going to have a bunch of tenants in that building, office or residential, who you're going to need to get out, who have leases that run between one and 10 years. If they're close to the end of the lease, off they go. If they're not close to the end of the lease, you're going to need to buy them out. And you're going to need to buy them out in such a way that they don't get wise to the fact that you're onto something much bigger because then they're going to want more money for it. And then you have to do this as you go. There's a, there's a developer. Yeah. There's a developer in town, um, Gary Burnett, and he's with Xtel. And right. he, he is one of the smartest people at this. He's actually uh, working in assemblage right now uh, on the other side of the block from his Diamond District building. It took him years, probably, probably a decade, to put the land together. Mm -hmm. And because he's smart, uh, and very smart at this, he <clears throat> knew enough to not let on. So every purchase that's made is made under a different LLC. It's oh, right, of course, because if you go on to something like traded.co, you can see all of the acquisitions that are being made and who was involved. And there's, there's a high level of transparency with, with that? or like uh, Not so much. Right. They've, they've tried in New York, especially, they've tried to bring more transparency to the mm -hmm. LLCs, largely because, uh, you know, ultra high value residential properties were really just as a way to hide money from somewhere else right. or offshore money from somewhere else. That's a whole other topic that we can get into, right? But at its base, if you need to build up an assemblage of 40, 50, 60 different properties for a very large project, or probably realistically five to 10 for a small one, mm -hmm. if you buy the first one, you don't necessarily want the, the, the fifth person to know that it's you who bought the first one, because then they're like, aha, he not, needs my piece and I'm gonna charge them more for it. Right. In the same way, once you get the buildings and you have tenants in it that you need to buy out of their leases because you don't wanna wait a decade, yeah. same thing. They can't know that you're buying them out to do something big, otherwise it's gonna be incredibly expensive. Gosh, I never even considered this because obviously there isn't, somewhere like here, there isn't just bits of land lying there open. You've got, no. there's stuff already there's stuff there on it. occupied. It's very rare that you're gonna get completely empty. Yes. So this can take years. It, yeah, it can take years. Depending on the scale of the building, it can take years. 
uh, and it doesn't always work, right? right? There's, um, I think we talked about this once before, like the, the whole concept of the, the spite house or the nail house, right? Yes. You yes. see this in China all the yeah. time, a little house with a highway going around it, right? <laughs> but it, it exists in New York as well. So uh, <laughs> on the southeast corner of Macy's, there's a little little tiny building. And if you look, the Macy's building carves around it. They put billboards on top of it. Right. It flows into the store as a single piece. It's a separate lot. Mm -hmm. It's owned by a different family to this day. Macy's pays them rent. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. The back corners of, of Rock Center, on the back side of 30 Rock on the, the west, on mm -hmm. the north and the south, there's um, a bakery on the south end and uh, Brooks Brothers on the north, I think it's the Brooks Brothers on the north end, and they're still like little old four-story homes. They're, they've been gutted inside completely, but they were people who held out. They didn't want to sell. So, so this is, becomes very interesting then, because actually it's starting to illuminate another level of risk that perhaps an architect is completely unaware of, mm -hmm. of the sort of work that's going on with a developer where they could be spending a long time actually putting together this sort of a assemblage. Mm -hmm. So, and they've got to be finding the resources from either they're spending their own money or they're bringing in investors to pu purchase the land. How does, mm -hmm. how does that work? Oof. That depends wildly. Right. And it depends on sort of what your business model as a developer is. Okay. So we typically, I think most people, architects, average people, whatever it is, are thinking that Developer buys the land with his money mm -hmm. or a loan to buy it and you know sits on it until he has enough of the pieces assembled. Um, but that's not always the case. There's this whole structure in, in development in most deals, really, in any industry called the debt stack. And the debt stack is you're buying a home, right? You go to your bank, like, I'd like to buy a home. Mm -hmm. And they will give you a loan for the home, but we're going to need 20% down in cash. And you're like, okay, you know, here's my cash. They give you a loan, off you go. Mm -hmm. But if you're a developer, you might not want to put down 20% of ca your cash in something. So you get another level of debt on top of it. It's a mezzanine loan. Right. And that's been recently restructured since COVID because the rules went, people got a little bit wild with it. So you're getting a loan for the down payment and then you're getting a loan for the major, the principal. Correct. But often that's not enough to cover it. So you'll bring in investors, right? And they'll and slowly that twenty percent or whatever is required, you know, for that's the purchasing land or a building. If it's construction, you need mm -hmm. forty percent cash down, right? Um, you can add in investors into that as well, right? And depending how much money they've put in, what deal you cut with them, mm -hmm. and where they are in the debt stack, it gives them control over the project, right? You know, the bank gets paid first. It was, they're banks, they're good at this. They've been doing this a lot longer than anyone else, yeah. right? So they really have no risk. So the interest that they're gonna charge you is whatever the going rate is, mm -hmm. you know, 7% or something like that right now. But as you get into the more complex bits of money, the mezzanine debt or the investor debt or things like that, they know that they're, they're second, right? So if the, if the deal doesn't work out, if the project goes sideways, banks getting paid first, if there's any money left over, it goes to them. Right, so they're gonna have a higher <laughs> kind of rate of interest because they're taking more risk. Correct. Mezzanine loans are, I don't know what they are right now, probably like 12 to 15%. Right. And then you've got hard money, which is like, bad example, it's almost like pawn shop money, right? Right. Right. So even higher on that. And then when you get into equity investors, they're bringing in money, but they, they're so far down the stack that they will, they want a higher rate of return or they want more control over your share of the deal. Right. So in taking it on a little bit of a tangent away from the architects for a second, but in 2009, when the global economy fell apart and real estate fell apart mm -hmm. as well, there's a firm, developers in New York, Savannah, uh, again, like very smart people. I mean, there's no stupid developers in New York, yeah. right? Otherwise they wouldn't still be around. Yeah. Savannah had teams of people and all they would do was dig through the books that were the debt stack. So 2009, it was all electronic, but you would still be given paper copies of the model of, of money for mm -hmm. the project. And they were, I don't know who does it, I don't know why or how it came about, but they'd be bound the same and it was like an encyclopedia set. So people would just go through the entire debt stack, find the cheapest piece of money that they could purchase to give them the most control over the project. Right, so they're buying people's bits of debt. Right, so if, if, if an investor or a loan or hard money, whatever it was, had let's say $100 in the project, right? Yeah. Project's not gonna work out. 
It's, it's pretty broken, right? Oh my God, you're right, okay. You walk up to them and you're like, you've got money in a broken project. This is not gonna go well for we're you. You're you at $100, out. we're gonna help you. You're never seeing that $100. I'll give you 60 mm -hmm. and it's now mine. And then you, you do that enough times, depending how complicated the stack is, and you can really, really stick at some people. And you show up and you say, you're not making any money, not only because the project's broken, but now I control a significant portion of it. I'm going to make sure you don't make any money. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take the deal that's on the table? And suddenly now, if you've done it well, and Savannah did it very well, mm -hmm. you control the entire project for significantly less money than went into it in the first place. So right. if you're in a broken economy, it's a little less broken because you've now brought the cost of the project down to something that's going to work. Gotcha. Wow. Okay, so that's how people can kind of come in and like swoop possession or control over a project where another developer has been plowing money into it and they're, now Correct. they're getting burnt. Correct. What about um, you know, you, the acquisition of a plot of land? Is mm -hmm. there any other costs that are associated with just holding on to the land? So obviously you've got interests that you're paying on loans if, you, yeah. if you're leveraged. Are you paying taxes on the land yeah. as well? Yeah, you are. So back to the assemblage thing, right? right. Like you're building this assemblage, you're holding some of these properties for a long time. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be emptying it out first thing, right? Because yeah. then, then you're paying for the land, either for the taxes or for the upkeep of the building that's there, or the financing cost to demo the building down. If you demo it, then that's a clear sign to everyone else that you're trying to get the land out from that something's coming that mm -hmm. they should be part of. So you need to structure these things in such a way that they're still going concerns and that they're still going to be able to, to survive. Right, so so you might go and buy some, like where there might be retail and try and keep the retail just doing what it's doing, collecting rent off it for just, a while until you've finished your assemblage. And just paying the debt. Got if it. it. If it can pay the bills and, and cover the interest on the debt, that's all you need to do. Wow, okay, so that, that's that's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk a little bit about air rights as okay. well, because this was also a very thing that kind of blew my mind and it's it's almost like we're playing a game of kind of real estate Tetris where you're, there's this kind of art of trading space above a building which right. can be collected and then stacked on top of your site where you want to mm -hmm. go to. So, how, how, so what is an air right? How does it work? Sure. I mean, it's, it's in many cities around the world. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually zoning rules that say how tall, how wide, how dense something can be. Um, some places don't. I think uh, Houston, I don't think, has a whole lot in the way of zoning. If you can put enough parking spaces for the building, that's good enough for them. Right. Right. New York, though, has very specific rules. And it, it stems from, I think, like 1918, which if you go up a certain distance, you have to start to go in. Because people were realizing as these 20 and 30 story buildings were popping up straight up off the sidewalk that mm -hmm. the city was turning into canyons, it was dark, and it wasn't pleasant. So the classic form of the Empire State Building is sort of following these rules. Yep. Now, the rules state that you can only build a certain percentage of your lot area or a certain multiple of your lot area, right? Floor area ratio. So if you have a 1,000 square foot lot and the FAR of the site is 10, you can build a 10,000 square foot building. Now, you're not going to build it to the full width of your or depth of your lot. So, you know, that would be a 10-story building if you did. Mm -hmm. But if you build half the lot area, now it's a 20-story building. But if your neighbor is a lower building and hasn't used up all of their floor area ratio, you're allowed to transfer that over to you. So it's a floor area ratio, basically. Mm -hmm. How much floor area which can be stacked into that? Correct. And is there height restrictions? Depends. Depends on the neighborhood. Um, some areas, yes. There's like a, an envelope that you can't penetrate. Right. So even if you have all the air rights in the world, you're going to run out of space in that envelope. Gotcha. And then there's other parts of the city where, no, just keep on going. So, so if, you, if you bought, say, 100,000 you know, square foot, whatever it is, square meters, and you, you could, in theory, have it as high as you like in terms of the internal floor space, mm -hmm. but then I guess there's no point okay. in doing that. Well, okay, that, that's where whole separate conversation. Let's go, <laughs> let's, go, let's, let's go back to the air rights for a second, right? So, um, you know, you've got a, a 10, floor floor area ratio of 10. You, you can now build 10,000 square feet of building if you had a 1,000 square foot lot, but you want more, right? right? You see an opportunity, whatever it is, high-end condos, office, nobody wants an office right now. So if you have more space, if you have more f floor area that you can build, you're going to make more money. 
but you've capped out on your site. So if your neighbors haven't used all of theirs, right, you can buy it from them, mm -hmm. or they can give it to you for free, but nobody's that stupid. And you can only do it for a site that touches yours. Right. You have to have 10 feet of shared common uh, property line. Right. You're, you're actually merging your lot with theirs. You're not merging it for tax purposes. You're not merging it for property reasons or anything like that. You're merging it only for zoning purposes. Mm -hmm. And you're creating a new zoning lot, which isn't the same as a property lot. It's just in the eyes of, of zoning. You have something called a ZELDA, a Zoning Lot Development Agreement, which is the terms that you come to with this other person to put the stuff together. Right. Now, if further down the street, there's another property that hasn't used all of theirs, well, you can get that too but you have to run it through a common property line to a common property line to it's your property line. You've got to line. maintain that 10 foot boundary line. Here. Right, you can't, you can't like in checkers, you can't jump over somebody. You have to flow through them, right? So <laughs> what you can do, let's say that you're gonna build a building, your neighbors have, maybe they're, they're pre-zoning, so they've got more square footage than they would be allowed mm -hmm. now. But further down the block is a whole bunch of stuff that's got a ton of space. You can scoop it all up, assuming you can make an agreement with all these people, and run it through your neighbor. And if your neighbor's overbuilt, then anything that you've gathered from the rest gets kind of deducted out of their overbuild, and then you can still flow it to yourself. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So literally, you, you, you're building some kind of corridor of connection. Correct. That's linking them all up and then you're kind of taking that three-dimensional air rights correct or the floor area really correct and then bringing it on if someone's overbuilt mm -hmm. so hold on so that, that's, that's an interesting thing so people see people overbuild um there are buildings that were built to the code at the time and then the code changed later so there are a lot of buildings in new york that are overbuilt for the zone that they're in okay i see right Right. It's a existing non-conforming condition. Grandfathered in, essentially. Okay, so they've they're, they're, they're done anything wrong. And, no. and what would happen if you were to overbuild and you just did what you wanted? You can't, because you've got to get it approved by uh, the city and the building department and all those things. So it, it doesn't happen. Right. Okay, right. gotcha. Now, there's, there's fun loopholes in, in the whole air rights thing, too. Um, a landmark can transfer it, I think it's anywhere on the block. So like a church could move its, its air around on the block, I think, I, I could be remembering that wrong. Um, but landmarks can also move air rights across the street. Right. Directly across the street or uh, kitty corner across Okay, so the church. Intersection. The church that's down, down below us here could transfer to us. Okay. Or across the street, because it's on the corner, across the street to the south or mm -hmm. kitty corner to the building over there. Right. So an enormous amount of research must go into like just trying to identify who has what air rights mm -hmm. and where have they already been transferred? Uh -huh. And what do those records look like and how do you kind of go through them? Is that something that's that's managed by the city? It the, is, the, it is managed by the city and it's all recorded. Right. Um, New York has a very robust uh, system of uh, recording deeds, uh, land transfers, mm -hmm. Zelda, Zoning Lot Development Agreements, um, on a site called ACRIS, I don't remember what ACRIS stands for. It's all there. Uh, and it's all it's all searchable by block and by lot, and then it just lists everything that's happened in the building for fifty or sixty years. Right. So you can see each deed transfer as the building has been sold. You can see who bought it, or the LLC that it was bought under, which then you have to go and, and dig for. Mm -hmm. But you'll also see zoning lot development agreements that have been recorded. Right. Got it. Okay. So th so this again adds another level of complexity with just the initial assemblage of trying to get something where you can put a decent footprint Correct. together. Then once you've got that, now you're trying to figure out, do we have enough space mm -hmm. for, to be able to build upwards? Yep. And all the time you're still trying to, you're on this kind of knife edge of, is it going to work financially because we've got to let the building out or we've got to sell it? And, mm -hmm. and, it, and then that, I guess that's kind of driving the space requirements as well, because there's going to be certain, you know, if you can't get as much as you need, then the whole project is just going to implode on itself. Yes. Yes, but sometimes it doesn't matter if the project implodes on itself. Right. And this is where it gets, uh, this is where it gets like really weird. Um, <laughs> this is when my brain is going to start melting. Yeah. Developers on the whole are looking to build a project like for, for reality, right? Okay. 
if you have a functioning building, one that you've just created or one that you've purchased, and it's throwing off money, it has tenants, tenants are paying the rent, the rent is covering whatever the debt is on the building, plus all of its, it's, it's a going concern, mm -hmm. right? If there's extra money that the building is, is throwing off, great, you can take that. But most of the time, as a developer, what you're actually doing is you're making your money on the debt. So the value of a building is, we'll do a very stupid simple example, is, is a multiple of the, the rent that's coming into it. Sure. Right? So if the building is making you know, $1,000 a year, mm -hmm. the value of the building might be around 20 times that. Gotcha. So the value of the building is about $20,000. So you have a loan from the bank for somewhere around that amount that you bought the building with and did improvements and paid investors, mm -hmm. etc. If the rent goes up to $2,000 a year, you've now got a building worth $40,000. You go back to the bank and you say, I know that I owe you $20,000. But the value has just gone up. The value of the building is now $40,000. Would you like to give me a loan for $40,000 and I'll pay you back the $20,000? And they say, of course, we'll, we'll do that. So they just gave you $40,000 worth of money. Yeah. The, the rents can support the interest payments on that, whatever debt service that you have. Yeah. You pay the bank back the 20000 that they gave you. You pay back anyone else that was an investor. You take that money, the loan, and you pocket that. Right. Now, the, the sneaky fun part about that is that money's tax-free because it's not an earning. It's debt. You still owe it to someone else. Right. But as long as the building has enough money to pay for its debt service, you get to keep that money. And if the, if the rent roll continues to grow and the building increases in value, you do it again. You refinance the building again. You take the debt and you pocket the debt. Gotcha. So it's just like kind of constant re refinancing of the building as it's going up. And as long as the building can, you know, can get those rents. Right. And so hence why you get into this kind of situation where rents need to be going up and property needs to be at a certain... Or rents or buildings need to be not vacant. Yes. Because there's a lot of debt out on them. Gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, this is quite, this has been, this is fascinating already in terms of how developers are actually making their money because they're, I mean, you said the developer, ideally they want to build something. Ideally they want to build something, but... But do they, do they have to? And is there like a world where, you know, people are, let's say just that art of building the assemblage and then the air rights. I would imagine that just piecing that together over 10 years or whatever it is, you might be sick and tired of it and then you just sell the piece of land to someone else who's going to take on the risk of actually completing it. Right, and this goes back to like how much skin do you have in the game, right? right? So if if just for the acquisition you need 20% cash down, but you've borrowed that money from everyone else, mm -hmm. other loans or other investors, you essentially don't have any skin in the game. But as the developer, you're paying yourself to develop the building. So you're not just gonna make your money on the end product of the building. You've priced into the development of the building a fee for yourself. Right. So whether it works or not, you're getting paid. Rewind. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's say we're selling condos. Right? Yeah. We're going to build a new condo tower. Mm -hmm. We've done all the modeling for it, and the math works out, yep. and it looks good. We've got banks loaning us money. We've got investors loaning us money. We've got as loans coming in, whatever. The, the project is financed, and it's going to go forward. We are getting a fee as the developer to develop that building. Gotcha. We'll get a share of the profits when it's successful, but we're getting a fee up front to do it. Right, so it's like, a, like the salary almost. Kind of. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I get you. If the project doesn't work out... You still get your fee. You've still got your fee. You still owe other people a lot of money, but you got your fee. Mm -hmm. And if the project isn't working out because of the economic world falling apart or something like that, the banks will usually play along and say, Look, forget paying us the principal, just pay us the interest for now. And that's all the banks care about is the interest. Mm -hmm. So as long as you can pay that, cut a deal with them, you can, you can float the project, you can coast the project. Right. If your investors get itchy, right, they can get out. They can sell their debt to someone else. They may not get the full value of it because the person who's buying it knows the project's in trouble and is going to be a bit predatory. Got it, which is like what you were talking about. Which is what we were talking about before. So if the project doesn't work out, and the debt can be sold, mm -hmm. and you don't have any skin in the game, 
okay, the project failed. That's a shame. You made your money. Yeah. It's the side of the, the side of the business I don't like, and that's not how most people operate. Yeah. But it is how some people operate. Yeah. But I guess it's it's I I guess most developers their their intention is to actually build the asset yeah. to get the money and be able to refinance. Right. So it's, you know, there, something much more valuable than just getting your fee. Yeah. There's, there's and then there's there's the risk of you know of owing lots of people lots of money. Correct. But the the scale the scale of profit is radically different from just the fee versus mm -hmm. a share of the actual success of the project. Right. Or if you're building it to keep it, the uh, accreting value of the building that allows you to pull out more debt from it on a refi, which is, uh, as we spoke before, is non-taxable money because it's not money, yeah, it's so. debt. So let, let, last time when we spoke, we were talking about another thing of how developers make money without necessarily building. And again, mm -hmm. th I think this is quite wild in a sense that you were saying that developers are able to make money okay one from the fees that they get from developing the site and doing mm -hmm. all that kind of hard work and assembling things together and doing their their risk analysis etc mm -hmm. etc and the feasibility and then also they can get paid through getting the finance together oh yeah um, so there's kind of two fees that they can be collecting on one is the fee of like bring in the possibility of physical space, and mm -hmm. then the other is a fee for bringing together the possibility of money. Right, so uh, a lot of development firms will have uh, sort of their own funding, basically. Like, uh, you know, a real estate investment trust is a good example, mm -hmm. any, any REIT. You've created a fund, you've created an investment vehicle mm -hmm. that people will invest in because they trust you as the developer, and then you're gonna take that money and use it for other things. Gotcha. Right? So those other things that you're gonna use it for are developing projects, mm -hmm. which you're collecting a fee on, right? But as the person running that investment fund, you're collecting a fee on that. Right. Right? You're gonna collect a fee every time that you can. It's almost like taxes, right? You know, you get, so you're like, a, like a management fee of to, to looking after somebody's money and um, putting it into whatever mechanisms it needs to be correct, put into. To... Correct. And <clears throat> typically when a developer acquires a building that's connected to a fund, there's often like an acquisition side, an acquisition fee on that deal. Right. And if they've used their own brokers on it, then there's a fee involved in that too. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to work with a... A, a really fun developer, I always used to joke that he would get paid three times. And on on anything, right? He he was the developer who was collecting a development fee on a deal, right. right? He had his own construction company, so he was getting paid to do the construction. He had brokers in-house, so any any deal that was transacted in the building was getting paid on that. And I'm sure that I wasn't part of the, the finance at that time, but I'm sure that he was getting fees on the finance side of things too. Right. And this mentality, this, this stretched out to everything in his life. So. There was a year that he took the entire office out for a holiday dinner. There must have been like 70 people or something. And everything was covered. Totally open bar, open food. This was like boom, boom time. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And you know that he just wrote that off. That's a business expense, right? So he somehow reduced taxes by taking the office out for lunch, right? <laughs> afterwards, afterwards, he said, who'd like to go for drinks? And everybody's hand goes up. And he's like, okay, meet at the whatever, whatever bar mm -hmm. it was, right? We walk in, he walks up to the bar, he knows the bartender, he puts down his black card. So he's getting the points on this. He's just taking the office up for lunch. Again, it's going to go through the company, so yeah. it's another write-off, but he's getting the points on it. And I found out afterwards he was a co-owner of the bar. <laughs> <laughs> he might have even profited from taking us out that night. I love it. Yeah, but it's, it's that kind I of thinking. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's well, it's kind of yeah, it's creating your world and making sure that there's well, like synerg a, a synergy as an entrepreneur between right. your two businesses that can be supporting each other. Right. So, going back to how developers make money, and there's this idea that they can be making money on the development fee for the site. They can actually be making money if they've got a fund involved. Yeah. So literally, an investor or part of the money that an investor is putting in is just getting eaten up as a as a fee. Mm -hmm for putting cash into the project. And I'm guessing in a similar kind of sense, the way when you invest in stocks and shares through like a mutual fidelity. Fund yeah, or, exactly. yeah, exactly. There's, Same there's thing. somebody's taking a little, a little cut of your fees. So, so they, and, then they, and then the final bit of payment is when the building's actually built and mm -hmm. they can be using it, selling it, taking mm -hmm. rent off it, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So that's the kind of 
a broad stroke of different ways that developers can actually be making money, which starts to paint an interesting picture of how much work is getting done to building out finance, building out the site, right. and then when they're ready, so when, when are they ready? When are they ready to kind of break ground? When does the architect get involved into all of this? It depends on the project and the complexity. Right. You'll, you'll sometimes bring an architect in early, uh, usually as one of sort of a, you know, the panoply of, of consultants that you've got. Mm -hmm. So early on, you're going to have a, a legal team who specializes in real estate who will be doing some of the due diligence for you. You know, are there Zeldas? Are there um, encumbrances on the site? You know, it's it's title search stuff, but there's also some some legal things there. You've got you've got your own acquisitions team who probably knows the people or knows the background of the current owner. So mm -hmm. there's that team that's doing some digging. And then you've also usually got an architect involved as well. And the architect is, if the zoning portion of your legal team isn't telling you, your architect will. How big can this be? It's rare that your architect, and shame on them, it's rare that the architect will go, hey, you know, if you get that other building mm -hmm. next door, or at least their air rights, you can do this. Mm -hmm. It's usually the architects kind of like, okay, what? Are, how many? How much? How much floor area do I have to work with? Okay, I will mass something out. Yeah, it will be this big. Um, if it's going to be condos, you know, you can get roughly well, that, this that, many that, on a floor. That's interesting and actually very a, a kind of pertinent point for an architect who's wanting to work with developers. That there's a huge potential value that you could bring to developers by starting to think like that, or mm -hmm. trying to meet developers further on upstream, if you yeah. like because I'm sure the architectural way of thinking about sites could be really useful in assemblage, assemblages and mm -hmm. kind of air rights and mm -hmm. putting that three-dimensional puzzle together. Yep. Whereas a team of developers might miss something or... Architects are great at solving, solving problems, yep. right? But in my experience, they're only gonna solve the problems with the pieces that are in front of them. Mm -hmm. right? And you need to look for the other pieces that are outside of the puzzle to find a better solution. Yeah. Like this this is not to get super nerdy, isn't this like one of the, the, the basic pieces of Star Trek, right? Didn't Captain Kirk like in his his academy days have a, some sort of test that he's guaranteed to fail on, right? Yeah. Right? And and the whole test is designed to see how they, they react under pressure. So what does he do? The night before he goes and like rewires the computer and then wins wins the challenge. Like architects should be thinking like that. Like, oh, here's the puzzle we're trying to solve and you know we can solve it. But you know, if you just did this, yeah, you looked you, at this, and you yeah. looked at this, because if you do that, we can do all these other things. Mm -hmm. And the other things shouldn't be how pretty is the building. The other things should be how much more money will it make. Yeah. Well, and then this is interesting as well because an architect potentially, if you're working with a number of different developer clients, then you've got intel on how different developers are working around the city, or different. You know, there's just another level of of intelligence that could be brought upstream. Yeah, I don't think most architects would do that. It's a little bit of a conflict of interest. Like I'm, I'm working with, uh, right. I'm working with an engineering team who are doing the work for developers next door to one of our projects. Mm -hmm. And the guy I'm working with, he's like, yeah, that's a team. This is a team. I've got a firewall between. Oh, okay. So you've got your Chinese walls inside of the inside of the offices. Yeah, there's, there's an ethical thing to that one. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is. The, la the, the land has been acquired, the financing is in order, yep. the bankers have been found, Found. the financial products are in place, it's institutional finance, it's yep. loans. The architect now gets invited into the scenario. Mm -hmm. And what are the developers looking for with the architects? What are the, you know, what's the, what's the value that the architect is, is going to be bringing? Well, it depends on the project, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you want there's usually a couple of different architects that you want. You want sort of the thinking architect, the one who's going to sort of figure out best and highest use in terms of square footage. Mm -hmm. But then you want the sexy architect. And the sexy architect is going to do something for you, which is going to either be create something in a style that is more luxurious, more sellable, more basic, whatever it is, whatever yeah. it is that is your business model, stylistically they're going to plug into that, mm -hmm. right? Or name recognition. Right. right. They have done these other things, therefore you want them on the project for that name recognition because people will be like, oh, designed by so-and-so. But most of the time that's not really the case. Right. And the architects, like, they're incredibly important to the project, but they're also not that important to the project. Because if, if a project's big, I'm going to go out to five, five architects. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I'm not looking to like to get the cheapest. We've talked about this before, right? Yeah. It's, it's not the cheapest architect. It's the, it's the within reason. It's the one who's going to do the best for your project. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I can go out to five, they're all interchangeable, mm -hmm. right? Some will self-select out in the process, and it's like, oh god, they interviewed terribly. Like they don't care, right? Or others, the fee is too high, or whatever. But you've gone out to five people that you feel are more or less equal. You'd be happy with any of them on your job. Mm -hmm. So. Is there like one architect that's going to make or break a project? No, because <laughs> there's four more that are just as good. Yeah. So, so how does an architect start to distinguish themselves in this in this kind of scenario? How can they how can they bring more value to a project? Or what would what would help them be able to win these sorts of projects? What would you be looking for? Um, usually having similar projects under their belt right. helps, right? If I have a pool of five architects and I think that the, any of them could do the job mm -hmm. and they've all come in at more or less the same value, right? The ones who have done more projects like the style that I'm doing or yeah. the location that I'm doing, mm -hmm. they're going to win the day. It's, it's the classic thing, like, you know, you need experience to get the job, how do you get experience, sure. right? Sure. It's, it's a variation on that, but that's one of the ways. right? Um, do, do you ever have architects who are well versed in the in all of this kind of upfront work that the developer is doing? They've got a good understanding of the business model of how the developers are working, or are they more passive and just kind of far you know, more passive, far more passive? Would would that understanding of the business plan be an advantage? Not necessarily of the specific business plan, but I think an understanding of how it works. Mm -hmm. would be good, right? Yeah. You know, uh, design is it's critical to a project, but it's not, as we've been talking about, it's, it's, it's a very small piece of the project. Yeah. And the project has been sort of figured out before it gets to the design stage. Yeah, it's almost like you've got, here's the envelope, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. Put, put something nice in the space. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't know if there's something that an architect can do to to be better than another one. Just if, if you get invited into something, mm -hmm. it's not the lowest bid. Some some people it is, but it's not the lowest bid. And most developers are going to come back and try and give you a haircut afterwards anyway. So price that in. Yeah. Um, it's for me personally. It's also just knowing how easy are they going to be to work with. Right. And there are diva architects, and then there are architects who are talented, but a pleasure to work with, mm -hmm. and it's it's always the diva ones, just like oh god, I don't want to have to hire them, and, the, and you know the the client, uh, so if, since we're doing stuff for other developers, the client might be like oh that's the people that we want to use, like oh, okay, we're gonna have problems, but okay, yeah. So it's interesting you were saying as well you know, some some of the value then architect, and this is more the exception, is if they're a big brand name, you've got obviously something like you know the Frank Gehry skyscrapers mm -hmm. you know they're complete they're very iconic here quite interesting i'm sure that 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 was a very conscious you know it's frank geary so mm -hmm. let's just make sure that the project but, has but, got but does it work i don't know i don't know like are they getting more rent in the frank geary building because it's a frank geary building that i would doubt i doubt it too i would doubt and i would doubt that the general populace is particularly aware of no of and what, and it, I, what it is. I don't think, at least for, for housing, I don't mm -hmm. think that there's a lot of people who look at the building and go, ooh, curvy. Ah, I want to <laughs> live there, right? Like the, the, the one place in the city that you're not going to see the Frank Gehry building yeah. is, is it, from inside is your inside apartment it? in the yeah. building. So, yeah, does it look important on the skyline? Sure. Is it important for the value of the building? Not as much. Mm -hmm. It speaks to. I think it speaks to an expectation more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And we all want nice things because if, you know, it's good to have something like that on the skyline. Yeah. Whether, whether you agree with the form or, or don't, it's good. You know, the Copper Building, which is just out the window down there that we were talking about before, it's simple. It's good. It makes the city better. Mm -hmm. And there is value to being better than the others, but I don't know if it really reflects in the rent. In the world of developers, how are architects typically perceived? Partners in a project, you know, people that you need to work with to get something done. Mm -hmm. 
um, depending on the scale of the project, they might have like a larger or, or smaller influence on the role. Do you, do, you ever, do you ever see developers kind of getting creative with their deal making with architects and say architects kind of get a bit of the back end if they're, if they're being flexible or creative of how their fees are working out? Yes, or? yes, and those are usually the projects you don't want to be part of. Really? Yeah, that usually means something's gone wrong. Right. If if a developer is as good as, at what they do, okay, they're not going to be giving out any equity for you. They're doing, not giving out equity for you putting sweat no. equity into it. No, and and they've got a they've got a line of banks and investors that they can tap for money. Mm -hmm. And why are they coming to you? Yeah. No. If if a developer ever since the architect, yeah, I'll give you equity, and it's either a very small project, and maybe there is something to that. Sure. Okay. So maybe in a more unsophisticated development yeah, projects. Yeah, smaller scale, world. almost like a design build something. Yeah, sure, there's something to that. But on a larger scale development, no. Yeah, too risky. Very risky. Very risky. We had a, we had a hotel brand approach us once with something like that. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for, for equity. And they're an international group. Like, you don't need our equity. Mm -hmm. You've got tons of equity. Why are you coming to me? Like, it's just, it smells bad, right? Yeah. From, from the get-go. Right, interesting. And it's not something that an architect could kind of strike up themselves as a as a deal or like I guess it's it's, it's irrelevant really because it's the the money is already in place which it, is, which is for the architect's fees. It, it, so. depend, it depends on the scale of the project, right? Yeah. We're doing we're doing a project that phase 1 is going to have a cost of construction of somewhere close to 500 million dollars. Mm -hmm. The architect's fee is like 1, right? Like do I want a portion of one million dollars to help finance five hundred million? I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Yeah, it's too, it's, it's too, too small, in, too insignificant. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. We were talking about a certain kind of business structure yeah. last time. What was it called? The skits. It was, it was like a form of business structure where people were able to buy. Or it, it it's it was like an IPO but not an IPO. Oh, a SPAC. A SPAC. Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Yes. 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 How does that play into all of this? And what is a SPAC? Um, or is it totally le a, a left field? It's it's a little left field. It was something that was sort of tried out in mm -hmm. the last ten years or so as a way to uh, move money around. Mm -hmm. It's sort of fallen out of favor. It's kind of like it's like the NFTs of financing. Right. Right. Um, it's it's a it's a shell company mm -hmm. that is publicly traded typically, that has money to be deployed, but doesn't know where it's going to go yet. Mm -hmm. So it's like an undirected investment fund essentially. It happens in real estate, but it's pretty rare, right? Because okay. it's a bit more directed and it's a bit more targeted. Like the the largest developers in New York have many funds, and some of them are SPACs, mm -hmm. but uh, like SPACs in name only. It's like we are going to go take your money and invest in in, in something. Got it. Okay, so it's not it's not a typical format no. that you would see in real estate. Less less so. Less so. Less so. You see it in a lot of other things. Um, uh, it was a way for Chinese companies to get onto a, a New York or American stock market, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's less and less something that you see in real estate. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. The state of the real estate market here at the moment. I know this is always a kind of precarious conversation. Last time we spoke during COVID this, times, this, it was it's grim, and it's but it's you know we're looking around here, and you know you were showing me earlier buildings that are kind of forty percent occupied. Yeah. I was in the financial district a couple of months back uh, in somebody's office, and you were just looking out into these beautiful empty buildings. It was. I don't know, it, it, it just kind of blows my mind, particularly when we, in the context of the conversation we've just had mm -hmm. about the complexity and the energy and the money that's going into building out these assemblages and just working out these sites and the huge amount of risk that's going into yep. actually getting something built. Yep. Then for it to just be empty mm -hmm. kind of starts to point towards some sort of, something that's not working. It's really not working. It's really broken. Um, the office market in New York, like anywhere else, is really broken. Mm -hmm. And it has been for basically since COVID. People aren't coming back. 
you know, there will be a day where offices are all full again, yada, yada, yada. It happens every time there's some sort of mm-hmm. major economic cycle. You know, oh, you know, after 9-11, oh, downtown is dead. No one's ever going to work downtown. It's full of people. It's fine. Yeah. Um, it will take time to work out, but it's not, we're not seeing it like rapidly pick up. Mm-hmm. And you know, depending what newspaper you read and whether it swings a little bit to the left or to the right, there's there's a different opinion there. Sure. But the, the facts on the ground are still the same. Like you can walk around the city at night and you can look up at these office buildings and you see construction lights. They're not mm-hmm. office lights, you know, the, the little single bulbs. And you're like, empty, 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 empty. Mm-hmm. You know, the when we were walking around the office here, I was pointing to a building just to the south and you can see a bunch of empty floors. This building is half empty. Mm-hmm. Um, major buildings, you see a lot of empty floors. I would say the optimistic numbers say that the, the vacancy rate in the city is around like ten percent. The other ones say around forty. Right. New construction, Hudson Yards, things like that, renting all day long, not a problem. Class B buildings, like the older twenties, thirties, New York brick things. Some of the brick ones we were looking at earlier. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know. Um, the fashion district, okay. which had all these old manufacturing buildings, they're not doing so well. Mm-hmm. So the city needs to do something about that and has needed to do something about that since since the pandemic started. Does it mean that there's deals happening like in terms of like, you know, real estate is getting cheap? Oh, oh yeah. Commercial, you oh, know, yeah. You can get commercial real estate. The trade papers have stories about this daily, right? right? There have already been major landlords in New York who've turned in the keys for buildings. Mm-hmm. They're like, thanks, this is not working. But you look into the secondary markets and it's staggering. It's just, it's not good. There's buildings that are trading at half of what they were sold at in, you know, obviously a boom time of like six or 2006, 2007. Right. But that's money and it's got to go somewhere. The, mm-hmm. banks, the banks are bolstering themselves for this because they know how much bad debt that they're carrying. Mm-hmm. They've, they've done this research. They're hiding that right now. Mm-hmm. And we saw, we saw a secondary like a regional banks tank uh, just when the interest rates went up because they were absolute idiots for not covering their own. Like, how, do you, how do you be a banker and miss that? I don't know, but yeah. there we go. There's, there's a time bomb in the economy. And it's real estate, and it's debt on real estate. Well, uh, you know, going back to what you were describing earlier about the kind of refinance cycles that a developer might be doing, if you've Correct. got that kind of, if you're in that kind of game, and now suddenly it starts going in the opposite direction, yeah, you've got a problem. Correct. If you, if you, <laughs> if you yeah, if you had that that building making a thousand dollars a year and it's worth twenty thousand, and then it's making two thousand a year, now you're highly leveraged. You, on it. You're highly, you've leveraged it up to forty thousand, and now. Half the people are gone, so it's making a thousand again. It's only worth twenty. Well, the banks are like, "Well, pay me my money." Yeah. Now, banks aren't dumb, right? They don't want something to go wrong on their balance sheet because it makes it makes them look stupid. Mm-hmm. So, the classic trick, and this was used in two thousand nine, called extend and pretend, right? <laughs> That's what it's called. <laughs> bank, bank, <laughs> bank says, "I know you're in trouble. I know this isn't working out." But maybe in three years or four years, things are going to get better. Right. So for now, can you pay me just the interest? We'll sort of stop the principal payments on the loan. Pay me the interest. And as long as you can pay the interest, we're, we're good. As a bank, I look good. My money is still coming in. Mm-hmm. As a developer, you look good. You've still got your building. And hopefully things turn around for you. But at some point, there's a reckoning. It's a Band-Aid. It's a band-aid. It's a band-aid. It's a band-aid, yeah. right? And there is a reckoning at some point. So you have different factions talking about what to do with this. Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of people saying convert office to resi. And I'm a huge believer in this because... The well, this would, this would seem to make a lot of, a lot of sense where there's, you've got one massive need versus an, a surplus. Yes. You've got a lot of empty space that people could live in. You've got but, a lot of people who need somewhere to live. But there's going to be like I'm guessing zoning protections here. That's the main obstacle, or there's zoning, but it's been done in the past, mm-hmm. so it's doable. There's um, there's just some common sense stuff. Some buildings work and some buildings don't. Right. Right. Um, in New York, I think the rule is you can't be more than thirty feet away from a window. Mm-hmm. So if you have an apartment that's more than thirty feet deep, that space is going to be kitchens or closets or storage. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you think about it, you got 
Uh, so you've got these buildings with really deep floor plates with the kind of core in the center of it. You've got you, loads of space that's not going to be used. That's not going to be used for anything. There's a, there's a building out in Williamsburg oh gosh, wow. on North 4th and Kent. It's a great big old white three or four story warehouse building. Yeah. And back in the heyday, I knew people who had apartments, like legal apartments in the space. It got bought mm -hmm. and it got turned into proper apartments. And the first thing, and massive floor plates. The first thing they did was just like scooped out the inside, mm -hmm. made a great big courtyard. Because now, now it works. Right. So there's a bunch of buildings in New York that will, New York Times did an amazing article on this with, you know, the New York Times graphics and showing you how it works and all mm -hmm. that. And it, it would explain it to anybody and it was good. The city, has a lot of buildings that would work. Um, the problem is that people, it's very expensive to convert them. Mm -hmm. And in order to make it palatable to owners and developers, there needs to be a tax break. And the last time they had this, a 421A right. tax break, it was an incentive for developers like, look, you get, uh, you're not paying property tax or whatever it was for 10 years, 20 years on the property and it was an incentive for people to build. And they yeah. did, in spades. Um, financial district, FIDI, which was early 2000s, kind of like tanking. Nobody wanted those office buildings anymore. Mm -hmm. And you could walk around at night and the place was a ghost town, just a ghost town. They changed the rules, they incentivized that part of town to turn it into residential units because the buildings are our smaller floor plates and yeah. they work quite well. Um, and it's not curtain walls, it's operable windows. So that's a rule that you can go check. Mm -hmm. And it worked. There's an awful lot of housing and an awful lot of old office buildings downtown. You walk around Financial District now at like 9 or 10 o'clock at night, it's vibrant. Mm -hmm. There's restaurants, there's people, there's bars. They've made a neighborhood out of it. You know, you walk around some of these parts of Midtown now, there's nothing. Yeah. It needs to change. That's really interesting. I mean, that's obviously a very, a kind of quite an interesting opportunity for a lot of both developers and architects if it's plausible. It's plausible, but the math is weird. Right. right. The math is really weird because if your building as an office building is only making 50% of what it was making before and you have leases expiring that are likely to not renew and maybe you get a couple more, you've got a good decade where that building's going to underperform mm -hmm. and it may be underperforming the debt, right? Yeah. If you convert it to residential, you're going to get into more. You're going to you may yeah, you're going to get into more debt, but the value of the building when you're done might be worth more. So you're going to go through more pain and you're going to burn through money. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you get a building that you can go back to the bank and say, hello, I'd like to refinance this for $100 million, right? And say, like, well, wasn't this worth a hundred or wasn't this worth like 80 million before? It's like it was worth 80 million, but it was only really worth 50 million with the rent that was coming in. But mm -hmm. I've spent 50 million on it and now it's worth 100 million. So did you come out ahead in the process? Mm -hmm. No, but you came out ahead in the reversion value of the building at the end, which means you can refinance it, which as we talked about earlier is tax-free money. Right. Because it's not money, it's debt. Gotcha. So, I mean, again, the, the other thing that's happening here, you know, is the, the housing market itself is really bizarre. Housing market in New York has always been bizarre. I've lived here like t over 25 years, and I've just I've never really understood how people afford the houses that they do. You know, it's it's it's. Well, I think the answer is they don't, and it's, <laughs> that's the problem. Like the, the New York Times does this. They have a I think it's in their Sunday section, like uh, uh, which house did they choose? It's almost you know it's the New York Times version of House Hunters, and and I swear it's just it's a rage article, right? Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's a, a butterfly collector, and he he like imports sweaters from Scotland made from three sheep, right? Their budget for they're looking for a new apartment. Their budget is four million dollars. Like, what? Like, who are these? What? I gotta get into butterfly collecting if that's the case. Yeah. So I, I don't know how it works. I've never figured it well, out. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, we were just looking at that building, the core yeah. out there, where you've got was it twenty six apartments in one building? Yes. Which well, is just there's, sort of yeah, it's it's kind of grotesque, right? Yeah, it's a it's mind bending. Thirty something story tall tower with twenty six apartments in it, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's two. There's sort of two divergent paths on that conversation, though. There's the ultra luxury apartments, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time in New York, those they're not built to live in. They're built as bank accounts. Yeah. It's right. a financial instrument and you've got oligarchs and people cleaning their money essentially, right? Yeah. There was an article. 
15 years ago, I think when the Time Warner Center was built, like, who are these people? How, how are we selling so many million dollar condos? Mm -hmm. And they dug into the LLCs and it's like, well, there's a warlord, there's a drug baron, there's, you know, all these things. Like, ah, okay, the magic of an LLC. So I'm not going to say that <laughs> all the money is coming from illegal sources, but well, I mean, it's 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 a it's been one of these classic ways of cleaning money is real estate. I mean, you look at you know you look at vast swathes of Dubai, which are just kind of empty. I mean, every major city has got this sort of correct. London, this, London went through this too. Exactly, this kind of perverse thing where you've got enormous buildings going up that are only housing a handful of people, mm -hmm. and they're worth insane amounts of yep. of money, and they're not really used or activated. Right. And it creates this very bizarre scenario that we have right that's 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 one extreme mm -hmm. of it and that doesn't help anybody because yeah. people need somewhere to live and you know, there's always this conversation about you know, where does the school teacher live where does the firefighter live like taking that out of the picture you know in New York that's that's the only way that works is in rent control these mm -hmm. people have to live far out and come in but then there's also like just the sort of like the average New Yorker call myself the average New Yorker right I was looking for an apartment a year and a half, two years ago. I was struggling to find something I could afford. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm doing okay. Yeah. This doesn't make any sense, you know? Yeah. There's, there's all sorts of development going on in Long Island City and Williamsburg. And the rents for these one-bedroom apartments are, you know, 52, 5,500 bucks a month. Who's paying? Who's? Who, how are thousands of people that's, 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 making that kind of money? Yeah, that's crazy. And, and they're not all rented. Some are. Some aren't. I, I, I mean, I, it's really it's really a city. Like if you know, a six-figure salary doesn't mean squat here. No. And you know, I've heard people say it's you know you've got to really be you know under two hundred thousand is you're going to you struggle. You struggle. Yeah. But that's that's. It's insane. That's insane. It's insane, <laughs> right? So it, it, it begs the question of like all these these five thousand dollar one bedroom apartments, mm -hmm. right? Who's renting them? Like, are they are they really full in the same way that all these million dollar apartments or multi million dollar apartments are full, mm -hmm. or or are they being built speculatively and it doesn't matter if they're full? Yeah. Because everybody's made their money already. Yeah. Right. And going the, back to what you were talking from about from the beginning, the, right? The, like the, the, the last part of it is rubber meeting the road. Is there going to be enough people to fill it at the price that supports all the financing? Mm -hmm. If there is, great. If there isn't, okay, well, let's figure out something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the conspiracy side of my brain is like, what's going on with all these units? They can't help people. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a problem. And housing is a problem. Like anywhere in the world right now, housing is a problem. New York is no different. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of empty office buildings. I remember there's a famous Buckminster Fuller quote where he talks about the kind of bizarreness of, I mean, and, and again, this is 30, 40 years ago, we were mm -hmm. talking about the strange scenario that you've got where at night you have all these empty office blocks, you know, completely vacant, and mm -hmm. then there's all these hundreds of thousands of people sleeping on the streets, Yeah, which is, I mean, obviously it's not practical to have. And that's, no. that's, another, that's another conversation, but the, the, the idea that, you know, that there's empty, huge amounts of space, which is empty, and then there's people that are struggling to get housing. It's a strange quandary. It's not an architectural problem. No, this is a deep societal. It's a societal problem. Problem. And it's not, you know, is it a political problem? Yes, but it's it's so multi-layered and everyone has an interest in that one. Everyone has a different solution for it. And, and honestly, the solutions for things like this take longer than most people's political terms. Mm -hmm. So if you start something with all enthusiasm and honesty, the next guy who's in power could flip it. So a benevolent dictator is what's needed. <laughs> it's working in Rwanda. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Super I'm, fun I'm, as always. I'm brilliant. I love speaking with you. And it was great to capture this on the podcast. And great. So, thank you again. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. 
This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.